You know, one of the things that we've heard is that uh, perception of symptoms is um, a very individual thing, and it is important for us then to hear from patients in terms of what's been important to them. Um, and maybe we'll just start briefly with introductions, in which I saw Glenda, do, Glenda who's in Seattle, do, do the other day, is patients are people, people have lives outside diagnosis. So as you introduce yourself briefly, give your name, and maybe one thing that you do outside of kidney care that you enjoy, or whatever else you want to talk about. So, uh, Henry, why don't you start off? Well, thank you. My name is Henning Sonderloy, and I'm from Denmark. Um, I started home hemo about 10 years ago. Um, I also am a trained psychologist, so I work for the Denise Kidney Association, where I help a lot of other patients um, with their problems. And a lot of patients, you know, um, tell me about their symptoms. So, um, other than that, what do I do? Not much. <laughs> no, I like to be out on the water. I like to to kayak and I like to uh, go on sailboats. The fact that trained psychologist, that's important information enough. Yes. <laughs> Glenda. Hi, my name is Glenda Roberts and I'm the Director of External Relations and Patient Engagement at the Kidney Research Institute at the University of Washington. And the thing that I do is I now do half marathons now that I've had a transplant. I've completed nine half marathons in nine years. Wow, I didn't know that here, Glenda. <laughs> Don. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dawn Edwards, and I'm from uh, New York, New York, and I'm an avid patient advocate. I've been an advocate for 25 years. I'm a 30 year kidney disease patient. I've done every modality that exists. And um, one of the things that I really like to do is um, I like to travel and I love to shop, especially with other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Maddie. I'm from the UK in the Midlands. Um, I've been a uh, home dialysis patient for 23 years, um, primarily on nocturnal home hemodialysis. Um, and I run a, med a consultancy advising medtech and pharmaceutical companies on patient advocacy, market access, um, commercialising, um, which is somewhat stemmed from my life experiences with kidney failure. Um, I am also a competition level skydiver, so I jump out very plenty to the pool and make pretty shapes in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn Wilkie, I've been on uh, nocturnal home hemo for, uh, I just passed 12 years in March. Um, and um, one thing that I enjoy doing, other than traveling, which we haven't unfortunately been able to do a lot of with COVID, is working. I work probably 80 hours a week between running my husband's law firm and running my sister's photography studio and doing all of the um, other kidney stuff that I like, that I enjoy doing, so. Jay. I'm Jay, I'm in Nottingham, England. I've been on dialysis for 10 years, most of that at home. Hello, which is interesting. I'm a psychotherapist, not dealing with dialysis patients, but in general. And a mindfulness teacher, which, yeah, I've been very interested in this past two weeks of reading. I'm looking to see how mindfulness could actually work on the physical and the psychological aspects. So interesting stuff. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, it means going to ask the first qu next question. Okay, so the, the next question is um, if, if very briefly in, in your experience, what are the worst and most burdensome symptoms of dialysis? And we're going to, the way we're going to run this is that we're going to, we've got six questions here. We're going to ask one patient um, to, to lead on that, and then we're going to ask um, another of our panel to either second what was said or how they would say it differently, um, and then we'll go on to the next question, and, and then we'll have a general discussion. 
So I'm going to start with, with you. Um, if, if you could just say that uh, it'll be valuable to hear alternative viewpoints, but not all patients should feel compelled to answer every question. Absolutely. So in, in your experience, what are the worst and most burdensome um, symptoms of dialysis? Well, um, I would say on a personal level, I will bring up some of the symptoms that are have not been mentioned here, and that is um, all the cognitive challenges that we have as uh, kidney patients. Um, that is memory loss, uh, lack of concentration, emotional instability, and executive functioning like task monitoring, self-monitoring, um, initiation of tasks, planning, organizing, flexibility, and goal setting. Those are all things that most of us suffer from, but I think usually they're glossed over by all of these um, physical symptoms. Um, so people, when I bring it up with people, they're always like, yes, that's true, that's really a problem for me, but it's something that's being forgotten in the day-to-day -day life. Um, and other than that, I think that the greatest symptoms for most other patients on dialysis have already been mentioned, like fatigue, and sleep problems, paralysis and restless legs and, and things like that. But I, I do think that there's, there's unfortunately a lack of awareness of these cognitive changes. Well, well, thank you very much for that. And you've immediately brought up a topic which has to be direct, addressed by all the workout groups, and that is this dichotomy between what we think as healthcare teams and researchers, because it's convenient to go on researching what everybody else has researched, and to really understand what is important to the patient and, and cognitive problems it is really greatly under-recognised and underestimated um, by the real community. So I'm going to just um, go, I've um, got them in front of me, randomly to somebody. Um, so, so Mandy, um, how would you answer the question in your experience? What are the worst and most burdensome symptoms of, of, in your experience? I'm, I'm going to make a bold claim, which is uh, now that I'm on maternal doing 30, 40 hours a week minimum, I have no symptoms at all. And that's after 23 years dialyzing. Now, I might have brainwashed myself to have ignored some of the symptoms because I'm just so used to them that perhaps I just don't notice anymore. Um, but comparative to when in the past I was doing PD and more traditional three times a week hemodialysis, I certainly have symptoms. And actually for me, the worst one was always um, dizziness. I was always dizzy every time I stood up, I was in a faint. That was, when, that was uh, low blood pressure kind of associated. Um, and then the only other symptom I've had in the result was um, my parathyroid or parathyroid and I had a bone pain but then my parathyroid was removed and I've never had pain since. And uh, day to day I would never know that I was on dialysis or had a serious chronic condition and so I guess my response to some of this conversation is it's really challenging because I think we under dialyze so many people that they are suffering far worse with a lot of common symptoms than perhaps they have to because dialysis isn't widely available at the levels such as a nocturnal regime and that, I know that's a much bigger topic. Um, but I also have noticed things like I improved my bone density by doing a lot of weightlifting and exercise and so there's a lot of holistic symptom management that I think and we should be encouraged to do which we often aren't which can help um, without necessarily using medication. Um, and I just wanted to echo from um, the previous talk, which I thought was amazing. I've never heard anybody talk about symptom acknowledgement and management like that before. And, and talking to so many patients who say they never, their symptoms are not acknowledged, they're just told, oh, well, that's just life on dialysis. Or they're told, oh, you're feeling a bit sorry for yourself, when actually they're in a bit of rage and pain. Um, and so that education of the staff and that understanding, I think, is so critical. And, quite widely overlooked and people accept that dialysis is just, you know, you're going to have all these symptoms and you have to learn to live with it. And I know my personal experience is you don't necessarily have to be living with it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can't name symptoms really that I really notice on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, maybe I'll just head on to Caroline, like, you know, think of the, the worst, most burdensome symptoms you've had and what did you find was effective in helping you manage that symptom? 
just uh, psychological. Anything. Or anything, 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 anything that you want. Anything. So the hardest one for me personally was I started dialysis at 24. I knew I was going to be on dialysis from the time I was like 13. Um, but for me, it was adjusting to the lifestyle and not I, I, just kind of not being as prepared as I should have been, but not also knowing how to prepare for such a giant paradigm shift from what I was used to being able to do to what I had to now figure out how to add into my life without trying to you know, change anything. And that for me was the hardest. Um, I'm, I'm with Maddie, I don't have a ton of symptoms anymore doing nocturnal. Um, my, biggest, my biggest complaints now are access issues with you know, our, a whole other whole other can of worms. Right, right. What about you, Glenda? When you were in dialysis, what bothered you the most and how did you help get your life through with the symptoms you experienced? So I really only thought I had one symptom until I heard the discussion today. And my primary discussion symptom was washout. Following dialysis, if you didn't get me home within 30 minutes, my husband literally had to carry me into the house and put me in bed. And I would then be in bed asleep for eight hours. And that created a problem because dialysis was over at three. If I slept for eight hours, it was then 11 o'clock at night. So now I wasn't sleeping anymore, and so I would be up all night with insomnia, which made it hard for me to function the following day. In terms of the psychological symptoms, I didn't have any because I had an attitude of, I'm not staying here, I am just stopping by on my way to get a transplant. And each and every day, I told myself, I am first going to bear to new dialysis. I don't know what is taking them so long to get retrained. And I'm getting a transplant. And I think having that attitude enabled me to ignore, possibly, some of the symptoms that other people had, because I was committed to getting a transplant. So, so Jane, I'm going to pick on you this, this time, um, and, and I'm going to ask you, does your dialysis team ask you about symptoms and how they affect you, and if they don't, what do you think would help your dialysis team to take more notice of your symptoms? Well, I've never, I've never had a questionnaire in the whole 10 years I've been on dialysis. Don't know, never, I've been shocked that this past part that I've reached out there research and that Absolutely shocked you. It's been very depressing in one way. But good to know that other people suffer from the same symptoms, and it's not just me, some comfort in that. But also, not knowing that, for example, the cognitive stuff, I thought it was a menopause, I didn't realise that was part of uh, being on fairly so much. Um, and what would help? I don't know, training, really. Training education. I would help imagine. Uh, again, mindful is training. So that there's more compassion, more understanding, there's more ability to tolerate patients suffering. I do feel for nephrologists and for you know unit nurses just seeing the suffering. I think it's such a a inability to cope for everybody because it's so massive. And we all need some sort of training in how to cope, how to how to accept this suffering, how to how to deal with it. Thank you. And and Dawn, how would you you do, do, does your team ask you about symptoms and what do you think would help the dialysis unit or your dialysis team take more interest in, in your symptoms and well being? I, I have to agree with my other colleagues here. Um, I don't think that asking the question uh, from the team, I don't think that that generally takes place. They don't just ask people what's bothering you or what's, what's hurting you. I think that um, the most important thing is for uh, us patients to take some of that responsibility. Um, I think that we need to be empowered to, to be able to communicate effectively 
directly with the members of our care team and let them know what's um, what's going on with us, what is it that is interfering with our quality of life, and that's not just going to come automatically. That's a whole, you know, that's another whole topic, but um, to me, becoming an empowered patient is what helped me to be able to get my needs addressed and have those those conversations that were necessary with my care team to have um, my symptoms or anything else addressed. John, maybe I'll just follow this uh, question to you. Wear, instead of your patient hat, maybe wear the hat of your healthcare provider. Uh, and uh, in, in what you see, what you've seen them do when they're taking care of you, uh, how could they incorporate, uh, like what could they change in what they do so that symptom management is front and center? And I'm it so becomes a part of what they do. That. I'm so glad you asked that. I think that, um, you know, we're on the right track now. I think that asking a patient is so important, making that a part of the, um, the, the dialysis assessment and um, before treatment. Is there anything hurting you that should be in the chart? And I think that one of the things that I've learned from being a home dialysis patient that differs from an incentive patient is that multidisciplinary team meeting that takes place monthly. We review the lab, we sit down and we talk, and they ask me, Dawn, what's going on with you? And I don't think that patients in center really get that individualized, personalized care. And I also think that part of that care plan and meeting, meeting that is supposed to take place annually, that the in-center patients don't get the, uh, the privilege of experiencing like a home patient, I think that that's another excellent time to ask about, um, you know, what symptoms you're having or, or what is bothering you so that that can be a part of the care plan for the year to come. So I think that that difference in between home dialysis and in-center needs to be um, molded together so that the in-center patients get the same um, privileges and benefits that the home patients get. That's a good point. Uh, Henning, what, what, what do you think? Uh, I also think that this, uh, we, can, we can see here that most of us are home patients. Mm -hmm. And probably because the incentive patients do not even have the energy to participate in something like this. Even if it was just these 20 minutes or whatever we're here for, um, a lot of incentive patients would say, well, I, I just don't have the energy for that. And that, I think, says a lot about how um, things like fatigue and, and sleep problems maybe have a huge impact on incentive patients that we as home patients do not feel. And, and like both Maddie and Carolyn said, you know, they don't really have much in terms of, of symptoms. I think that's typical for a lot of us who are doing all. So, so I'd like to finish, um, and, and, and maybe we should just go around all the patients very briefly on, on, on this one. And, and that is, just think of your next clinic visit. Now that you, you know, after this meeting, what would you like your clinician, whether it's a doctor or a nurse, because I know a lot of clinical interactions take place with the broader team, what would you like them to ask you as the first and most important part of that clinic interaction? So I'm going to start, I'm just looking at my screen here, so I'm going to start with Glenda, and um, what would you like the first question to be from the clinician who sees you in your next clinic visit? I'd like for them to ask me, how have I been feeling? Which is an open-ended question, which would give me the opportunity to talk about all of the different experiences that I'm having, rather than having them go down a checklist to say, have you had this or have you had that? Because sometimes the way and somebody mentioned this, people talked about fatigue. I never thought I was fatigued until I heard the definition. So if somebody just asked me, how have I been feeling? I would probably give them a lot more information than they would think to ask me. Thank you very much. Dawn? 
I would like for my care team to ask me, is there anything in particular that's interfering in your quality of life or in you being able to accomplish your day-to-day -day, um, goals? Thank I think you. that's the most important. Mandy? I guess um, I think I would echo very much about the day to day life and is your, is, your, is your condition actually holding you back from things you want to do. I think also if asking me has anything changed because obviously each time you go to clinic things might be different in between so as well as really asking you this and to how you're feeling but also has anything, is anything different you feel, um, you recognise that you're, you know, you're getting worse in some way, you've got a new symptom. Um, and also, it's just once you've asked the question, is really actually listening and acknowledging the answer. Um, I, 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 the amount of times I hear patients sort of quite dismissed in a sense when they do report a symptom, I think stops them then sharing that information in the future because they don't think it's going to get them anywhere. Thank you. Caroline? Yeah, I would, I would echo John and Maddie um, with just saying, with quality of life because for a lot of us that's what's most important if we're just stuck on a machine doing things you know day after day and we're miserable and we can't do the things that we enjoy why are we going to be bothering to continue doing that um so the, that would be my most important um, jane i would have liked to have been given a list of the symptoms that i've read about in the last two weeks and asked how i am relation perhaps to these symptoms or, or you know. uh, so how am I feeling and what do I think I need? What do I need as an individual? What would be helpful? I'd, be, I'd like to be told what's available but I've never been told anything that's available really other than a chat with a psychologist. <laughs> Um, I, I think the simple how are you doing as the first question is, is um, what I would like and it's also what I get so maybe that's why but I would also say like the others that um, um, asking about how things have been since last time we saw each other is, is a really good way of, of opening up a conversation. Well, thank you uh, all. I mean, I think one of the, if, if I was, if there's a unifying message all through the morning that is heard loud and clear from the patients uh, is that uh, symptom assessment often is not done, is often not prioritized. Uh, and simple open-ended questions such as, how are you doing? What has changed since you're, what's important to you? Uh, what has changed since the last time we saw you? Uh, is probably more important than what is your phosphorus level and what's your hemoglobin. Um, so thank you all. Uh, we'll have the, uh, this is going to be time for lunch now. Uh, and so uh, we'll break for an hour and then we'll have, uh, uh, we'll go to the individual breakout rooms. The breakout rooms are equipped uh, with the TV screens that, that you can use to project your slides. Uh, and they're also equipped with uh, uh, Zoom and uh, people that are going to participate virtually uh, would be there as well. The wardrobe chairs, uh, we'll figure it out in terms of keeping everybody engaged, getting the patient voice, uh, involving the people that are there uh, virtually, including, and then of course the people that are there in person. And uh, with that, we conclude the morning plenary.